All right. So we're going to look at, I mean, following on from Easter, we're going to look at death as a theological concept. And then we're going to very briefly look at the deaths that the disciples um, encountered. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to stop doing it. Here we go. Oh, I would start doing it if I had my notes in the right place. Why would I? I've only been doing it ages. Okay, either way, death. All right, children. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So we have um, somewhat of a quandary, a dilemma, in that we will, spoiler alert, just in case nobody's considered this, we will all die. There's no uh, real sugar coating, I guess. Regardless of um, our religion, our age even doesn't have to be a factor. Our culture certainly isn't. Um, our gender, like nothing matters in respect of the inevitability of death. And that's a fact. Uh, death and taxes, but definitely death. Uh, whatever we may uh, think we can do to avoid it, ignore it, delay it, the end will come. Um, and that's just, you know, the amount of death I've been, like, uh, experienced in the last couple of years is just, it's getting a little bit trying now, you might say. Either way, it's such a fundamental um, reality of human existence that all religions address the cessation of life, the end. Um, Christianity, of course, is no different and is included in the all, even though it's distinct uh, because it's true. So in the scriptures, human life and death are not uh, synonymous with being and unbeing or existence and non-existence. Um, they are two kinds of existence, but there is no non-existence. Once we are born, um, our souls will go on forever. That's just where they're going to go, to be fair. So death is separation in a nutshell, essentially. How do I want to put it? The... The soul is physically separated from the body. A cadaver, a corpse, a dead body. Um, I think potentially universally everybody recognises that the soul has left the building, as it were, however it's dressed up. The person is spiritually separated from God in as much as the wages of sin is death. Um, and death itself is a process and a journey from one kind of existence into another. One could argue into a more real existence, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going metaphysical at the moment. So our consciousnesses, I don't know the plural of that, consciousnesses, yep. Yeah. Our individuality, our individual consciousness continues. However, it continues in a new place and a new condition. And that's, there are countless uh, Bible verses regarding the condition of your consciousness in the grave, certainly. Um, all, uh, I don't want to say fear as in, fear in scriptural terms doesn't always mean to be afraid. It can mean uh, have a healthy respect for, um, it can mean consider something awesome in the archaic um, definition of the word or inspiring, that will do. But as such, we fear death. Some people, like, just outright are afraid of death and others uh, treat it with uh, the respect that it's due. If you look at palliative care, um, yeah, it's a very serious business because everybody will die. Other forms of health care, um, you know, may get less, well, what's the word, like, mm, less, a less comprehensive delivery because of course if you're I don't know if it's something relating to a certain illness the chances are you may not get that illness but everybody will arrive at death's door so the result of Adam's sin um Romans 5 15 
and 17 to 18 and 6 23 and 1 Corinthians 15 22 the fear of death uh, death becomes a part of our consciousness becomes like makes its uh presence known long before we ever approach the end if we're lucky like the traditional end of our earthly years i.e older age because we are constantly in a state of spiritual death until we believe in christ and that's scripturally sound as well All right sonny um, the physical, the reality of physical death, the cessation of life, rests on our minds if we are cognizant of reality, basically, and potentially of a certain age, or if we've experienced enough death, um, you know, that can bring on a preoccupation, not necessarily an unhealthy one, but an increased awareness of the brevity of life and the importance of uh, being grateful for the time that we do have and using it productively and fruitfully and not wasting it and not spending it on the wrong um, activities, uh, you know, cherishing the time that we have with those we love before we don't have it anymore. Um, so this, this death that is on our minds, it's regardless of the temporary distractions that we pursue, and that's according to Hebrews 2.15. I love Hebrews. Um, and the central message, uh, the gospel, in fact, but the central message of the entire Bible is that Christ died, however, um, within his resurrection, in the act of returning once more, he defeated death, and that's, First, that's attested to like all over the place, but First Corinthians 15, 3 to 4 is a good one. Because um, he conquered death and the devil who controls it, and I can't think of the verse off the top of my head. I think maybe I've got it noted here. We know that Christ holds the power of death in his own hands. Um, Hebrews 2, 14 to 15, Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Also theologically, Christ is the sustainer to, in order to be the sustainer of life, or the creator and the sustainer of life, one must have uh, power over death in order to uh, keep death in abeyance. That's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit also, to stop things falling back into the nothingness from which they came. Um, I digress. As a result of having the power of death in his hands, literally, um, Christ is in a unique position, I guess, is he can and he does give us, I'm going to silence my phone, I'm so sorry. He can and does give us eternal life. And our eternal life doesn't, uh, the eternity that we will experience, or the eternality is a better word, does not depend upon physical death for it, for it to begin, if that makes sense. It's redundant to speak of um, an ongoing situation as beginning at that point because it's already in us, the eternality, regardless of whether we believe, because um, as we know, many people will go to hell. So at the point of belief, at the point that anybody comes to believe in him, he has crossed over from death to life. And that's according to John 5, 24. And even though obviously Christians still physically die, um, death can never separate us from him who died for us. And there's a, oh, the most beautiful verse. And I can't, for we are convinced that neither death nor life, oh, or principalities, I can't think of, it's shocking, can separate us from the love of God is the end bit. Either way, um, Romans 8, 38 and 39 attest to the fact that we will not be separated from him as a result of death from the one who died for us. Um, and therefore, to a certain extent, we regard physical death as a benefit um, by which we come into Christ's immediate presence. I mean, of course, you know, Romans 8, 9, 9, 8, speaks of us uh, having the spirit of Christ within us, but into his immediate presence is attested to in Philippians 1, 21. 
and discussion um, of death is um, it's one of the most fraught topics of conversation that can ever really uh, be spoken of in non-generalized terms like in you know when as and when you're experiencing the death of a loved one I can attest to this it's well, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever have to go through and you don't stop going through it either you you know you just learn to um focus on the on the present as it were and uh rely ever more on Christ for strength so discussions of death raise many issues but the issue of the time between um, I'm not even sure I want to go here but the, the time between physical death and the resurrection of the body and like I said the Bible attests in many places um, as to the state of remembrance for example of um, of you know the soul um, post death let's put it that way pre-resurrection um, we enter the Lord's presence um, in Philippians 1 23 and 2 Corinthians 5 8 it set, attests to this that we enter the Lord's presence at the moment of death the verses that I am thinking of and was referring to our Old Testament because there's a hmm, how much do I want to go into there's a there's a certainly a different setup and um, because of course these people didn't have access to um salvation via Christ because he hadn't been born yet let alone died yet uh, for us there are uh, i'm choosing my words carefully because i see buzz is here there are alternate views let's say that the bible i mean the new testament however those two verses uh, take some doing as it were if you want to argue something differently soul sleep is one of the alternate views there is somewhat of a case i mean there are certainly in uh Oh gosh, this is from memory now. Daniel 2.12 mm, speaks about the dead rising from their sleep. Paul certainly speaks about the dead in Christ rising. Um, however, uh, Philippians and 2 Corinthians speak about entering the Lord's presence at the moment of death. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I'm not going into it. Um, just as a very brief uh, non-triggering uh, thing, Purgatory is allegedly a place or a state of being in which sins, um, like non-dealt with sins, I don't know, lingering sins, I don't know what the correct uh, term is, but the purging of these sins. Me personally, and this is all I'm going to say on it, me personally, when death, sit, uh, when death, when the Lord says, I will remember your sins no more, they will be as white as snow. I will not see your sins, but Christ in your place. That's enough for me. That's enough that he can uh, utterly forgive and forget all of those sins. So also, the, oh, I want it to be the last thing I'm going to say. The sufficiency of Christ's death and the sufficiency of God's grace. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Um, our our sins were fully paid um, according to Hebrews 9.26 and Hebrews 10.2 and Hebrews 10.10. 10. And soul sleep, going back to that, is the notion that the dead exist in an unconscious state until the resurrection. The verses I'm thinking of, it says you will have no remembrance, I think something like of the Lord uh, to be grateful for, like family, you know, that kind of thing. However, Jesus, I mean, this is post-resurrection that Christ is saying this, of course, so that's to be taken into account. But he tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's according to the Gospel of Luke 23, 43. Uh, proponents of purgatory, which is usually Roman Catholics and to some extent, I guess, Eastern Orthodox and some uh, members of the High Anglican Church, off the top of my head, um, and proponents of soul sleep who are usually restricted to more kooky sounding uh, like organisations to be charitable, um, do make uh, good faith attempts to um, back up their views with scripture. 
the majority of Protestant Christians um, certainly disagree. Let's, let's put it like that. Christ's death and resurrection have removed death's power and the curse. Um, so when, you know, when we have loved ones uh, pass away, if they're Christian, of course, and that's, that's another thing. Me personally, I mean, we're not to, uh, we're not to ask even in our hearts who will ascend unto heaven, you know, for, because of the knowledge that in, in doing so, we like crucify Christ again, we bring him down. But I'm hopeful that the, the last moments psychologically speaking and and from uh, studies into near-death experiences those last moments can last longer than they appear on the outside as it were to people uh, watching and I'm therefore hopeful that because I don't believe that you can be saved after death but I do hold out hope that a person even if they can't tell anybody physically um, is hopefully given a final chance is able to um, you know see beyond the veil and see reality as it were the reality of christ who is the truth um and because of this first this not because of that because our uh, if our loved ones are already believers um first thessalonians 4 13 says we don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope and paul speaks at length um you know referencing the sadducees about the resurrection um and the hope that is within it because of Christ's triumph over death, his defeat of death, we can grieve. Like, it'd be uh, pretty weird to just have someone who's been there, you know, seemingly forever, if you're the younger of the, you know, if it's a grandparent or a parent or something like that, and then uh, just, like, start whistling and skipping around and getting on with your life. We can grieve. Um, we do grieve, but we grieve for ourselves as opposed to, um, you know, we're grieving the loss in our present everyday life of these people and, you know, what they meant to us. And mostly the most vouchsafed um, comment within palliative care settings of, um, you know, the dying person's regret even is, um, you know, lack of courage, I guess, not having the uh, wherewithal or the, that's not the right word, of not doing things uh, when they, you know, when they thought of them, when they not seizing the opportunity, that's, that's it, not spending their time wisely enough, i.e. with loved ones. Um, because of that, we are, Baz, any minute now, babes, <laughs> you might be getting onto your pudding now. Because of that, like, I can only speak for myself when I say that I show that I care about people by spending my time on them because my time is very precious to me. Um, and it's more precious because I, I see that the Bible advocates love like all over the place. If you have no time to love, love becomes meaningless. Like literally it becomes something that cannot be performed without time. You know, if you knew the world was ending, in a short space of time, you would make sure that every moment had a significance. Whereas, you know, when you're young, potentially a teenager, you you throw it away like it's going out of fashion. You you know, you sleep through most of it. Either way, I digress, but it's uh, on my mind a lot. Because of the triumph over death of Christ, um, we can grieve, like I say. Um, however, we retain our confidence. So we're not despondent and we're not lacking hope when uh, when we observe the um, absence of loved ones and, you know, the, the impact it has on us because we know that they, um, if like I say, if they're a believer, have already eternal life in him. And we, an we anticipate, hopefully, eventually, if we're blessed with the ability to mature spiritually and, uh, like, age to, I would say, a great age, but compared to the Bible, the they're pretty meagre. Um, we anticipate death as merely a transition um, from this uh, world that's under the dominion of wickedness into the kingdom, um, you know, in which we get to glory, God, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen, etc. So now, albeit briefly, I just want to 
reiterate that. Um, we're going to look at what we know, or a little of what we know, about the deaths of the disciples. And, spoiler alert, um, very few deathbed, like uh, all your family around you scenes. In fact, I can think of only one anyway. And I'm, I'm not sure if John, I don't know what, like what the actual scene was, to be honest, but it wasn't brutal, is the point. <laughs> Excuse me. So we all know, I hope we all know, well, um, disbarring Muslims from the, we all know, but Christ was crucified. That's a fact. That's an eternal truth. That is, that's a done deal. Like I'd say, come at me, but I just, it happened. Take my word, and not only my word, take the word of the Holy Spirit through, um, the writers of the bible take the author of the bible as an authority please christ was crucified um his disciples uh yeah some of them um post resurrection as it were after uh, christ ascended bodily they um began to fulfill their commission with uh, what can only be described as gusto uh, they went very, very long distances, some of them, to preach the gospel of Christ crucified and resurrected and mostly died, you know, within uh, carrying out their commission. And some of them, pretty gruesome. Um, most of them, most of them, yeah, most of them became, um, like, canonised. It depends how, which branch of Christendom uh, like uh, you attest to, as it were, but they became saints, is what I'm looking for. Um, in uh, I can't say most, some Christian churches, some branches, and many denominations of Christianity, um, specifically in relation to their martyrdom, also. But we're gonna, like I say, take a brief look. So, Peter, um, Peter, right, Simon Peter from the Gospels fisherman uh roman catholics hold him to be the uh i think the first pope of rome yeah i think so that guy peter the apostle he was crucified um you know this is according to sources but in 64 around 64 ce so around 31 years after the resurrection and crucifixion crucifixion and resurrection he also was crucified uh, in Rome, as opposed to um, in the place where Christ uh, preached his ministry. And according to, no, I'm just trying not to insult you, Baz, because I know you two get very bazzy. Um, yeah, he was crucified upside down. Um, and Well, there's been oh, much speculation, but it is believed that he was crucified this way on his, you know, upon his own request, because he felt, he did not want to die in like manner to Christ and not, you know, uh, as a means of uh, like, what's the word, reverence. He, um, you know, he thought that was a bit much. So he, seen as how he had to be crucified, he asked to uh, die in some different way and that was upside down. Yes, that's um, Right, the upside down position uh, that Peter adopted or requested um, likely, I mean, I can't imagine how not, made, uh, you know, caused the blood to rush to his head. Potentially this would have led to uh, hemorrhaging of the brain, certainly hemorrhaging, but brain hemorrhaging more, more specifically if you want to go full gruesome. And then we're going to move on to Judas Iscariot. Uh, this Judas is the one who for 30 pieces of silver betrayed Christ Christ knew uh, that this was about to happen as referenced in the accounts of the Lord's Supper in which he tells him basically hurry up, get on with it, like, you know, do your thing. That's not a direct quote, obviously. Um, and and Judas came, returned you know, after the supper and identified Christ with a kiss for the, uh, for the soldiers that he brought with him to seize him. So uh, subsequent to that, it turns out, I mean, it can't imagine how it wouldn't but it appears that the betrayal of Christ was uh like an inordinate burden um to Judas and he was unable to handle that and ended up committing suicide taking his own life 
um, in Potter's, Potter's Field, yeah, if I recall my Bible rightly, um, and he hanged himself. And we know this. There are two accounts, and often, well, there are at least two, yeah, two that I know of off the top of my head, and they are held as a contradiction in the same manner as we have many uh, Quranic contradictions, as it were. Um, I'd love to have written this down first in my notes. I believe that it could be in Matthew. One of them's in Acts, let's put it that way. So that was certainly wrote by Luke. And one of them, I think it's Matthew. So one of them says, uh, you know, he was hanged from a tree. or he hanged himself from a tree. But there is a, a more graphic description which um, can cause confusion, even for Christians, I guess, when they first read it, if they hold up the two accounts um, as a, you know, comparison. Because Acts 118 uh, says, with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas uh, bought a field. And it says, there he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. So for anybody, cheers, Dad. For anybody, if, if they ever ask you to reconcile those two accounts, Luke was, of course, a medical doctor, much like Zaki and Ike, but nothing like Zaki and Ike, uh, just in the fact of being a medical doctor. Um, and, of course, as a, as a doctor, you know, if a body has been hanging from a tree in a Middle Eastern temperatures, as it were, you know, certainly spring temperatures, as it was uh, Passover had just happened, or was was even happening, I don't know the exact timeline, um, the, bod the, in the insides would certainly putrefy, and uh, when the rope eventually breaks, you would, I, I don't know about you, you would fall headlong, because we're not talking about physics, but falling headlong would cause, um, yeah, your body to burst open from the gases and all of the intestines spilled out. So it's just a more medically accurate graphic account of, it's kind of um, the other gospel is attesting to he's hanging there, as it were, and Luke is recording um, what happened after he was hanging there. Because, yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't, he didn't just trip and fall and everything all spilled out. That's silly. Um, Luke was a much better doctor than secular. Okay, Andrew, we're going on to Andrew, who is uh, Simon Peter's brother. So, uh, so whereas Peter had a similar but different um, means of execution, as it were, in that he was crucified upside down, Andrew was also uh, crucified somewhat, but not nailed to a cross. And instead of being nailed up, he was tied to a St. Andrew's cross. I don't I'm pretty confident it wasn't called that before because if he, of course, became St. Andrew. And the St. Andrew's cross, the best way I can uh, visually, well, verbally represent it to you as a visual thing is if you think of the flag of Scotland, that is called the St. Andrew's cross, but as opposed to a a vertical and a cross beam, a St. Andrew's cross is, a, is an elongated X. Let's put it like that. Um, and it doesn't, it may sound as if it's an easier option. Um, I'll have to uh, furnish you with those afterwards, uh, Baz. It may seem like an easier option, but it would uh, prolong at least, theoretically, it would prolong a different kind of suffering as opposed to having your wrists and your ankles uh, nailed. Um, and it's estimated because, of course, if then if there are no biblical references like so Judas Iscariot his death is recorded within the bible and therefore that's a take it to the bank that's what happened with the others because of the uh like timelines as in they went out about the great commission um the sources are not infallible um but there are like best um, theories I guess or, or more widely held um theories either way Andrew is estimated to have been in the agony that he was left in for at least two days and two nights um, before passing away, which is, they're all gruesome. I mean, let's have it right. Matthew, bless him. There are quite a few different versions of how Matthew died, and I'm just going to give the most common, um, and I don't, yeah, I've never tried personally although I know they sell them in certain, uh, I'm not going there. Yeah, okay. So um, the most common cause of death for Matthew 
points to him being stabbed to death, which again is uh, it's not the best way to go. Um, painful in as much as, this, I mean, the stab wounds are not as painful as they may look or sound actually, but the um, repercussions of them, the after effects and the potentially slow death of bleeding out, depending on whether he died, you know, from blood, blood loss or organ failure, like just a test of the fact that it wasn't going swimmingly. Um, although uh, I'm going to pause before I go on to Thomas and say that um, I, I think it's Paul, either way it's the Holy Spirit, that, you, you know, we will be persecuted, thrown in prison, uh, killed, you know, not all for the same person, but that's what we're to expect to be hated, etc. Thomas uh, travelled outside of the Roman Emperor um, eastward um, in order to fulfil the Great Commission and to spread the gospel, and he ended up being murdered in India. Um, you know, stabbed to death, again, is not the most peaceful or um, serenity-inducing way to go, but this was also what happened to Thomas. Um, and Thomas is said to have been speared, um, like, by... Uh, you know, multiple times by soldiers who uh, came in order to, well, eventually kill him. Uh, and now we're going to look at Bartholomew, um, who was a part of the inner circle. Um, however, is less referenced um, in the Bible than, than some of the others. Um, and legend has it, so not the Bible, um, that he had a particularly, uh, well, I mean, they're all painful. Like, I don't know how to keep differentiating. But he was, bless him, uh, he was um, skinned alive. Let's just cut to the chase. Um, and as torturous and painful deaths go, I'm going to call it and stick it somewhere near the top because that's just got to be, I mean, your skin is the largest organ of the body connected to almost every single nerve. Like, I don't know how to, like, uh, yeah, envision a more horrific way to die, honestly. You know, unless you, I suppose, unless you lose consciousness. Let's not go into that because he said also, <laughs> but um, he said to have been decapitated, um, but he was, I guess, already in shock, unconscious, um, you know, please God, by the time he was beheaded. I mean, Jesus said they will hate you, um, and he got it spot on. James the Great. Um, Christ had two disciples called James. Um, that's, like, well known. So James the Great, I don't know if he chose his own epithet, he's the son of Zebedee, um, and he had a... Uh, yeah, very violent death, a common one, but uh, nonetheless a very violent one, and he was beheaded. That became more popular, as it were, um, throughout history as that went on. But according, again, the story goes, the narrative is that he was falsely accused um, by a guy, um, and then the man repented and was decapitated uh, alongside James. And I feel like that's kind of reminiscent of the story of Alban in as much as, um, no, Alban, I think it was his executioner who converted because of his, um, we won't say joy, but his uh, calm acceptance of his fate and his, his being able to preach the gospel even, you know, even as that happened. Simon, um, the zealot now. Uh, so, yeah, not um, not Peter. Not everyone, well, lots of people got new names, but no, Simon the Zealot we're talking about also has a few versions of um, his earthly end. I won't say it's the most well attested because I'm unsure actually, but the most disturbing one at least involves him being sawn in half. And unless I'm very much mistaken, that was, that's said to have been Isaiah's fate also i mean yeah like the jewish uh texts that speak of the martyrdom of isaiah 
like the Old Testament guy, that's a, it's pretty impressive as well. I had the chance, uh, it said, to get out of there and um, he didn't take it. So Simon the Zealot, um, if, if, you know, if that was the way he went, that's, uh, I've got an image in front of me that I wouldn't even, maybe I'll post it in the members. It's, yeah, he's upside down being sawn in half. I don't know how historically accurate it is. But it doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. And now we're going to go with, um, yeah, James the Less, um, also known as James, uh, the son of Alphaeus. Alphaeus. Um, yeah, let's have a little look, see. So the other James um, had his head cut off. Um, this James, James the Less, had, uh, you could say it was more painful than that. <laughs> like it all becomes redundant at the really painful end of the spectrum, as it were. But he was stoned, uh, not to death. Mm -hmm. No, he was stoned and then clubbed to death. I mean, you know, you know. <sighs> right, and after the stoning, um, his bones, including his skull, like does, you know, if you've ever been headbutted, like it's, it's pretty tough going, your skull was uh, basically brutally um, smashed in with a club until he uh, lost consciousness and obviously after that i'd love to say shortly after that but i can't i can't be certain he died that's a fact and now on to philip and we're almost done actually philip also died on a cross um and i guess the murderers of the disciples uh went in for like hardy heart irony kind of thing um some versions of the story uh say that he was tied to the cross uh in like fashion to the, the stories people tell of Andrew, um, but most versions of uh, Philip's crucifixion have him crucified uh, as Christ was, like in the same manner. Jude. Um, Jude was an apostle, also known as Thaddeus, uh, Jude Thaddeus, Judas Thaddeus, or I can't pronounce that, Labaius, maybe I can. Uh, his death is recorded as circa 65 CE. So again, like 32 years um, after Christ's, um, the year of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And he died in Syria. Or more, like, yeah, what is Syria now? So he's often uh, visually depicted with an axe. Um, yeah, I was going to do a little brief thing. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, he's re he's uh, usually portrayed with an axe. And um, it is said that the axe symbolises the way in which he was killed. Um, so no, no real need to go into that much. And lastly, uh, Matthias. So, again, a few versions as to even where um, this disciple uh, died. And, you know, by whose hand, as it were, um, yeah, that it's, I won't be able to, um, like, I can't make that call, but there there are some accounts of him being beheaded um, and more accounts of him being stoned to death. So it seems to me that I've ended on a bit of a downer, as it were. However, none of them, I'd like to say, actually, off the top of my head, None of them um, renounced Christ. That you know that that doesn't seem to be a well. That isn't a factor, and it is like it's a well-attested psychological fact nowadays. But it's indicative of a truth teller that they are willing. You know, very few people, other than potentially those suffering from psychotic delusions, in which case actually that debars them from what I'm going to say and will die for something they know is a lie. Um, I guess with the exception if they know they're going to die, if they do denounce it in some other horrible fashion. But, yeah, most people, if willing to die for the truth, because, all, all, you know, death is a fearful thing for many people, especially those who don't have the reassurance of salvation. Um, but, yeah, mostly 
people who are attacked like to see the actual perpetrator punished. It's just one of those quirks of human like psychology that you, you're far less likely to die for something you know is a big hoax. It's just, why would you? Right at the 11th hour, you just go, oh, no, only joke, or whatever it is. But they didn't. They were willing to die for what they believed, which attests, you know, if you're not a Christian, it attests to the fact that whether you believe it or not, they certainly believed that they had seen a dead man raised to life, spoken and conversed with him for some, you know, weeks and weeks, actually, before his ascension, because they continued their mission uh, without him, or not without him, they're the spirit of him, but to somebody who do doesn't believe, to all intents and their purposes, without him. So that's what I have to say about that. 